Hello, everybody. It's great to see you all. Happy Monday. Yay. I am rocking the messy hair don't care look today. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Mainly because it's been a busy weekend. I did a lot of random things here and there. Um, one of the things that about this book that I'm really excited about today is that it kind of defies a couple stereotypes. Uh, first of all, we don't see a lot of post-apocalyptic or, let's see, what are we looking for? We're looking for uh, the word of dystopian. I love dystopian books. They're one of my favorite types, uh, mainly because like you get to see something that's so far out of normal that it actually becomes normal. Yay. Um, you also have this opportunity to kind of see like, oh, there's big problems that don't quite identify with me. And we don't see that very often. A lot of the times when we see that we think, oh, it's so far off, it's not going to be something we have to deal with. So especially with the life that we are living right now, it's very easy to get caught up in that. But one of the things about these books is that they are often very, they're very centric on one culture. And that culture is usually uh, a white culture, particularly in the United States. We're starting to see more and more diversity come up, but not nearly as much as we would like. So Enter War Girls by, by Tochi Onyebuchi. All right. This is a dystopian book that takes place in Nigeria. Nigeria is located in Africa. It's on the western side of the country. All right. It is actually very prominent. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world right now. They're known for their, they have lots of oil there. They have a very large population. Um, also, a lot of writers are coming from this area, which is fantastic. Um, one of the more classic novels that come from this is uh, Chen Wei Chebe's uh, Things Fall Apart. That was taking place in the 80s. However, we have more and more Nigerian-based authors coming forward, which is fantastic. Um, one, of, one that my students might be familiar with is The Children of Blood and Bone. Tommy Ademi, she's not from Nigeria, but she's Nigerian American. Um, and, but her, her story primarily takes place in a fictionalized version of, uh, of Nigeria. So while I don't know too much about, uh, the author's, um, the author's story of where she's from or what she does, um, I do know that this book is fantastic because it shows a lot of science. It shows a lot of military history, has a lot of great options that come into this. So I'm actually really excited. The thing about this book is that you'll see that it is fairly thick. It has a lot of pages to it. And the way that the book is written is that it's a slow build. You have kind of the before, you have the middle, and you have the after. Generally, what this is about is about two sisters. All right. I identify with this greatly. I have two sisters. So I mean, we're one of, I'm one of three. And there is that bond that comes with being siblings that you really enjoy. It starts with them being together, then apart, thinking that we're never going to see each other again. Then, oh, we might be able to see each other again, but at what cost? So that's what's really cool about this book is that there's a lot of different parts. There's a lot of different moving pieces where you have to judge what do you want versus what's good for everybody. And also one thing that I'm excited about in this book is that it shows how you can fight back in more than one way. Some people choose to fight militar militaristically. There is There might be a need for that. I mean, so one of the sisters is a soldier and the other sister is a scientist. So you see how you have the academic side of change, but you also have the physical military si side of change. My job's not to tell you which one is which or which one is better or worse, but you very rarely get to see both sides of that in any post-apocalyptic or dystopian story. So that's exciting. We get to see different sides of it. And even better, we get a different story of this country in Africa than what we normally see as Americans, which is, oh, they're all so hungry. That's so, so corrupt. There's a lot of disease, famine, war. When, yeah, that's a part of their reality, but it's not the whole picture. And so when we get authors like this, we can see, oh, we have authors who are here. We have creative minds who are from here. And we get to see a different picture, which is very exciting. All right, so with that, we're gonna start the beginning chapters of War Girls. 
by Tochi, Tochi Onyabuchi. All right, part one. Chapter one. Southeastern Nigeria, April 2172. The first thing Anya does every morning is take off her arm. Other war girls have gotten used to sleeping without their arms or their legs, but Anya's phantom limb haunts her in her sleep. In her dreams, all she, ha she has all her arms and legs and can run. She can run far and fast and away from whatever's chasing her. She can hold her rifle, she can aim, she can feel her face with all of her fingers. But then she'd wake up and try to touch her body with a right arm that's not there anymore. She never got accustomed to waking up without all of her body there, so now she sleeps with her arm attached, even though sometimes she accidentally crushes and bends some of the machinery. Even through sweat of her night terrors, rests through some of the more delicate circuitry. Even though she wakes up every morning with an imprint of metal plates on her cheek, which is why she gets up earlier than the rest of the camp and spends the quiet morning hours at her bedside station, oiling the gears and tinkering with its chips. In the darkness, she spreads from the, met she spreads from the metal and she works in the only light in her tent. Ify sleeps through all of it. Oni takes a moment to listen to Ify, one, Ify snore. The birds outside have started their chirping, but they're still quiet enough that Anya can hear Ify's patterns. Two smooth snores and a hiccup. Anya's dreams are a blur of chaos and blood and screaming, flashes of gunfire, rain falling hard and never hard enough to wash away the tears from her face. Ify's face is serene in slumber, in, in slumber, the tribal scars soft ridges on her cheeks. Her lips turn up at the edges. For almost her entire life, the child has only known peace. When Ani finishes, she disconnects her arm from its station and places it against a spot where her shoulder ends. She'd left that battle long ago with a stump, but the doctors had cut away the rest of her arm because it had also gotten infected. Now there's only mesh wiring over the opening so that her socket is more like a power outlet than anything else. Nanobots buzz out of the metal arm socket, trailing wires. The threading then attaches the metal to her flesh. Electricity shocks through her body in a small burst like scraping feet against carpet touching the doorknob. She's able to flex her fingers. She tries out her elbow joints, bends the arm, swings it slowly back and forth and rotating the shoulder, then stretches out and lets out a massive yawn. She waits until she's outside the tent to let out her get let out her gas. The world is green and wet with recent rain. The dew hasn't dried from the grass. Leaves bend on tree branches overhead. Wind whips around her. Engines scream overhead, and Anya looks up to find in time the aerial mesh. Massive humanoid robots with green and white stripes painted on their shoulders screech through the sky as though they've been doing for the past year. Shoulder cannons and thrusters attached to each of their compact bodies. State-of-the-art nav systems. Yet, they can't detect the rebel Bifran camp right underneath their noses. As long as the single signal dampener they rigged it to hide from this outpost from the Nigerian authorities is up and running, they're safe. The government forces can't see the rebel flag waving right below them. A blue background with half a yellow sun at its bottom. Golden rays radiating outward like lightning bolts. Ani stretches her flesh and blood arm shoulder, arches her back, and listens to the crack ripple up and down her spine, and she shakes herself loose. She's still only wearing her bedclothes, a compression bra and athletic shorts that stick to her at the very heavy delta humidity, but it's comfortable enough for a morning run. She makes her usual circuit of the camp. First, she heads to the camp's periphery, past the school for the little ones, and one of the few auto body shelters, a place where faulty robotics can be tinkered with, where arms and legs can be made, where the girls come become augments, given limbs or organs more powerful than the ones they were born with. Sometimes it's a place where medical operations happen and people are given new eyes or bleeding and their brain has stopped and a brain case has to be installed. Onye knows the, some of the others sneer at the worked on have never seen war. Half limbs become half limbs because they're trying to make someone whole. An augment is not an ugly thing. 
She hangs a left in spots o- an orchard of the fruit trees that line it. Beyond the orchard, the vegetable garden sits encased in a greenhouse large enough for a few people to enter and roam in. Rotating spigots programmed to automatically spray the water on the plants hang from the ceiling, and the artificial light panels go along the wall. The camp is it hasn't needed them for some time, but with the light when the nights get long, too long, they can't let the food suffer. Oni spiles outward on her run and passes the mess hall, usually empty this morning. But as Oni runs by, she spots a girl in the jungle, fatigues, and jacket unbuttoned and loose over her over her shoulders and leans into her rifle, dozing. Chike. At the sound of Oni's feet brushing the grass, Chike starts awake and, and straightens. It's a wonder she doesn't hoist her assault rifle to aim right at Oni. She's so jittery. When Chike realizes who she is, she settles back and her posture relaxes. It's only me, Oni thinks. Who will Pafkua your head who will Pafkua your head down when your commanding officer finds out you've been sleeping on your watch? Oni ambles past. These mornings run double as patrol surveillance. Backing up on those watch, the po- outpost may may be hidden from the radars and scanners. But what's keeping a green and white from walking right into their perimeter? At 15, Oni is the oldest amongst the camp. The younger ones, some of them new to living on their own, and some of them just learning how to be people again after growing feral in the jungle, having trouble adjusting, staying awake during patrols, concentrating during school, not screaming in their sleep. But with some, their guns are bigger than they are. They're slowly turning to steel, turning into the type of girls who can depend, be depended on during an attack, the type of girls Onya would be happy to have at her side and fight, proud even. Her route takes her farther to the practice grounds where the weapons training happens. Jungle green trees and their broad, heavy leaves hide the girls from above, and there's enough foliage here to absorb most of the noise that they make when they shoot towards the shoreline. She gets to the cliff and looks and looks and below her lies the beach. Melee combat happens here too, when it's scheduled, but only during warm seasons. Oni will, rec- will occasionally arrive on her morning runs to see one of the girls already laid out, naked beneath the sun, giggling or roughhousing, and she's reminded that many of them are just still kids, and the sun for them is still a gentle, loving thing. Some of them have never looked up into a clear blue sky and out of place twinkling and recognize the drone ready to drop a bomb on their houses. Maybe some of them have seen it and still don't care. Those are the ones that turn out to be good fighters. Reckless, but good. In the distance is the water, still more black than blue in the early of the morning. Onya hears a faint sound of metal banging, of water sloshing against steel, and what she sees is specks of small shapes along the horizon. She knows the mer- mineral derricks, old and rusted, but still capable of leaching the resources from the delta, their resources, the blue minerals buried beneath Onya's feet and farther out, beneath the ocean floor. That is what Nigerians are killing Biafrans for, not for morning passes that Onya doesn't think about set- setting changes to those things and blowing them into the coral debris. It's been said that minerals that divide are the divine right of the Igbo, their blessing from the Chiku, the supreme being whose energy powers from all existence. But minerals are just dust only, powerful, important dust, and nothing more. Other than Nigerian mechs that streak overhead from time to time, the Derricks provide Onya's only glimpse of the outside world. There are more people out there than us and our enemies. Every time she sees the derricks, she aims at an invisible gun and at them in her still human hand. She doubles back and presses the hanger where the mobile suits are stored. They're smaller than the Nigerian mechs that screech through the sky overhead and closer to the shape of actual humans. Rust spots their armor and Oni knows there isn't enough lubricant around for all the gears that need it. But the beat up suits, stocked with ammo for their guns and equipped with night vision and a neural adapting system are enough to get by. Then there are the skin suits. Depending on how old or how big you are, they fit tightly enough to suffocate you or they hang off you like hand-me-downs, even after you press the button on your wrist to compress them. The skin suits are supposed to collapse to fit like a second layer of flesh for journeys past the camp, where the radiation gets so thick 
that skin peels off almost immediately. The ammo crates, the mandarin, have mandarin characters on them, and their sides are fluorescent blue ink. But the girls know by looking at which container holds the 6.2, the 7.62 millimeter bullets, and which hold the ammo for the shoulder cannons and the mobile tech suits. They know which will hold the bullets for their assault rifles and which one will hold the knives when the bullets run out. It never seems like enough, their smuggled arms, but orphans never steal enough bread for a feast, only enough to last the day. Oni continues to the obelisk, but even before she gets to it, she can see the sparkling sparks arching out of the base. It looks like a mini mineral derrick, microscopic by comparison, driven into the ground. Beneath Oni's feet, fiber optic cables run through the camp and beyond, buzzing the earth constantly with charges, zapping the soil over and over to release the water soaked in it. The water is then purified and made available for washing and cooking and cleaning. It also collects the minerals that power nearly every electric device in the camp. Today, it's somehow busted. Oni crouches at the base and sees the blackened stretch of stretch of tech stretch of tech running along the cables, ending right before pierces the grass patch. She didn't build to this, so she doesn't know immediately intimately as the others in the camp do. But she's fixed things before. She takes a long time squinting at the mechanical carnage, and before a flash of movement changes in the air around her, suddenly, Chinello's at her side, all long and gangly limbs. Still, somehow, she manages not to make a sound. The opposite of clumsy. In fact, Oni remembers the first time she saw Chinello, tall even as a child, move with grace she'd never seen before. Covered in ash and soot and blood, Chinello had moved with a confidence of a general. Now, Chinello was wearing a jungle-colored compression bra over her small chest and pants with many deep pockets. A green patterned bandana and holds, her, holds back her locks. Ancient obsolete cell phones, relics of a different era, hang from her, hang from her necklace, clanking together as if there's some weird music Onya doesn't particularly like. You want to break our water, is that it? Chinello jokes. She jokes like that from time to time. Jark jokes about how all the girls are here, for some reason, not made of the type of material to create children. Onye, Onye heard one time that when your water breaks, you are nearly birthing a child. But looking at Chinello, she, the sheen of her gold skin glowing is a mix of night sweat and morning dew. Oni sees a girl who only knows how to laugh. Hurry up now, before we are all stinking. The green and white smell us. Onia shoots back, smiling. Chonia, Chinello smirks, and her, the bees buzz out from her hair. Tiny robotic insects that tell Chinello the temperature and the water density in the air and the amount of radiation in each drop of rain that lands up from them on the tree leaves overhead. They tell her how warm Oni is next to her. They tell her the state of Oni's prosthetic arm. And as Oni watches, the bees descend into the well to tell Chinello that what needs to be repaired. And then they go to work. Oni remains crouched on her haunches, a position of battle readiness. Chinello sits back on the grass while the robotic bees do their job. We need to make a run, Chinello says, like she's telling Oni to bathe more often. Her arguments are more internal. Her, arg her augments are more internal. A brain case for her brain, ways of having data transmitted directly to her, even having some metal where bone should be. On the outside, she's as human as anyone. But finely tuned mechanical tricks and finely tuned ma machinery ticks and hums inside her. Still, with a body that can connect its own to camp's network, she's more human than machine. Cyberized, but still, she bleeds red blood. And what we find on the forest we can't with that we can't find here. Oni stares at the well lit at the well as light spreads across the once blackened portion of the circuitry. That's the thing. You never know. Our tools are rusted and our guns need ammunition. That's just for another day. One light on the greenhouse went out. Nights are getting longer and our generators won't last. Oni wants to tell Chinello that they've lasted this outpost for years that they made more with less, but it's a conversation they've had a million times before. And what if there are green and whites on patrol? Chinello elbows Oni. They haven't found us yet. What if they would find us now? Because neither of us have bathed in a week. 
Oni tries to say with a straight face, but her smile curls at her lips, and she knows she can't hold it back anymore. And their laughter echoes through the trees. Chanello rolls around on the wet grass, clutching her stomach as the bees fly back in her hair. Oni wants to tell her to be quiet, to stop laughing before they alert whatever Nigerian patrols may be nearby. But the sound of Chanello's laugh warms her too much. Let me say goodbye to the little ones at least, Oni says, and she pushes herself upright and hauls Chanello to her feet. And maybe we'll find some napkins too, Chanello says, looking to the repaired well to see if it's working properly again. Some of the girls have begun to bleed. How many years has it been? Even after all this time, still, it moves on you to see if he sleeps so piss peacefully. The ratty, coarse blanket rises and falls, rises and falls. Sometimes Oni wishes that two of them had just had ports, rounded, rounded outlets at the back of their necks, and some half limbs have, so that she could just plug in the wire and connect it to Ify and see what the little girls dreamed. Maybe dancing in a cool breeze on a pretty dress, no mosquitoes. Oni shuffles to Ify's side. And inside is the tent is still awash in blue from a morning that has not yet fully arrived. And she knows if you will try to resist being woken up so early before her classes. But the girl can stand to learn a little industriousness. So Oni sits on a crate by Ify's bed and gently shakes her awake. The girl's eyes open a little, then grow wide for a second before settling. Even in the darkness, Oni can see the purple of her irises flecked with jagged shards of gold, and her breath catches in her throat in the beauty of it. Hey, little one, Oni whispers. Chanel waits at the tent's entrance, so Oni can feel her impatience, but Oni has made it her mission to spend as much time with Ify as she can. You never know when you might have to lose a loved one in war, or even a loved one that might be. Her days as a child soldier are fresh in her mind, too fresh, so Oni has spent several long seconds running her hand along Ify's bald head before Ify turns and pulls the blanket over her entire body. Hey. Onya shakes her a little bit roughly this time. It's too early, Ify whines. I have to go on a run. At this time, Ify turns. The girl is learning toughness. Onya can tell, but there is still a pleading look of a pleading look in the gold and purple of her eyes. We have to look for some supplies. Chinello is coming with me, so don't worry. I have a buddy. You and Enemeka can can keep company. While, while I do what? Oni frowns. Is that spice in your voice, Ify? Well, while you go over your lessons, Oni pulls out a tablet from a shelf and powers it on. The screen flickers and Oni slaps it against her knee. A little too hard, but it casts light. It casts its light from the inside of their dwelling. But Oni, I already get high marks. Let me sleep. Fine, Oni puts the tablet on the bedside table. Don't study. And in class, while the teacher is teaching, if you like, don't listen. Don't pay attention. Be on your tablet. Play your games. Talk. Cha-cha-cha-cha-cha. Her voice rises. But if you come back into the tent with anything less than first position, a pause for dramatic effect, we shall see. If he spends one last brief moment under the covers before she throws off the blanket and swings her legs around. Oni gets up and turns around, turns before Ify has a chance to smile. Janello strikes, stifles a chuckle. In the corner, Enimaka stands, hunched over and powered off. If someone wanted to be charitable, they would say her multicolored armor gives her character. The faded purple metal of one forearm and pitted orange on one breastplate, the patchwork of green and red and yellow and orange and blue wires that make up her ribs. They'd say it was like a dress, so not of choice fabric made from beautiful gowns, a riot of color. But really, it's a droid made out of whatever tech Onya and the others stumbled on in the previous runs during skirmishes with the green and whites. The metal plates on her legs are rusted in the corners. The sockets of her eyes are dark and gri with grime. Moss runs along her backside, and the other parts are fuzzy with fungus. Onya stands on her toes, inhales deeply and to unlock a series of chambers and valves in her artificial internal organs and spits a mucus encased stream of nanobots into Enemaka's ear. When Ify used to ask how Enemaka came to life, Janello would joke and say it was like a wireless connection with Oni as the ro druid's router. Enemaka's eyes light up, hear hears hum and stands upright, squares her shoulders and scans the room. 
Watch her while I'm gone. Onya commands. Yes, Mama. And Ye says back. And she powers all the way up. Her voice sounds like two voices at once. And then she walks over to Ify. So, little one, mathematics. And while she while she says that part, Animaka sounds too much like Oni for her own comfort. Comfort. Oni grabs her pack from the tent's entrance and hefts her rifle over with her prosthetic arm. Make sure she ha- make sure she shaves. She calls over her shoulder. Clean. I don't want to see any missing spots on her head. And we have a heat wave coming. And then Oni steps out into the chilly morning. Chapter 2. If he waits until Onye leaves the tent before reaching under her pillow and fumbling around for her accent, the tiny piece of tech, a ball small enough to fit on the end of an ear swab, has nestled itself in the folds of her bedsheet. When she finds it, a grin splits her face, and Yamaka hovers over her, and Ify instinctively turns to her back while she fiddles with the accent. Then it fits right inside her ear. The darkness of the little hut evaporates, peels away like the skin of rotten fruit to reveal lines of nodes of fresh connect net internet connectivity that binds everything and everyone together. Her pillow sprouts a series of pulsing blue dots. The metal beams supporting her roof glow with aquamarine lines. And Yamaka turns into, into a forest of nodes and vectors. If he can see inside her and the watch gear and watches as the gears turn and the core of her head thrum. She can see how her movements are enabled by wireless connection from the terminal that helps the power camp. And Yamaka is rustier parts, glow a shade of red that worries Ify, but the rest of her is a healthy blue. With her accent, Ify can see all of this. All the things that are happening in the camp's closed network, bright as the ocean under the sun. Data. Remember, Enyamaka, you promised not to tell Onyi, Ify says, frowning at her minder with the much sternness as she can muster. Onyi can forbade her from tinkering with any tech that might interfere with the wireless. But after the second time it had disrupted Onyi's comms while she was scouting on a mission, Onya had nearly thrashed her senseless. Only at the last moment did Onyi return to herself, and there was change in her eyes. When she got angry, a cloud came over them, and if he could tell the storm was coming... Onya's eyes had cleared. She had given Ify only an extended tongue lashing. Ify never meant to disobey Onya, but when she looked around with her life and nothing but questions, whenever Ify inserted her accent into her ear, the world exploded with answers. Almost every piece of tech, even unconnected items like her bed and her pillow and the biomass of scouting parties, brought her back to the meals with that made her meals with. All that explained through her accent in a way that made sense. When right now, she's not messing around to try to hack into Chanel's comms or the obelisk that tries to take special minerals from the ground to the power of the camp. She's just watching, surfing the connections, riding the waves. A ca- the accent also lets her talk to Enimaka without needing to make a sound. She remembers where she is and that, o- o- that Onyi is still probably near near enough to sense her and she shifts her jaw to put her accent into sleep mode then sh- shrugging on her skirt which looks and feels more like a burlap sack more than anything a human being is supposed to wear she takes a seat on the crate bo- before her mirror or rather a shard of mirror okay and yamaka she says cheer- cheerfully to her accent i'm ready there's a little bit of hair on her head just a small shield of silver fuzz but it's just enough to make her itch in the warm seasons. So she sits to, as still as she can manage while Enyamaka runs a razor smoothly over Ify's scalp. With each stroke, Enyamaka sprays a small puff of alcohol on the nearly shiny space. Ify winces. Sometimes Enyamaka isn't as smooth as she'd like, and Ify is left with a cut or two that she has to put adhesive over. And then to just to endure the taunts of her age mates. Ow! You should not be moving. And Yamaka says in a half-robotic voice, my reflexes are not fast enough to account for your constant shifting. Always my fault, if you thinks to herself. Ugh, I'm finished, she says without even having an Yamaka inspector. You wait outside the classroom this time while we, when we get into school, okay? There's extra bite in her voice today, and that's all good cheer she felt upon finding her accent has left her. By the time she gathers her tablets and her rucksack, daylight shines through the the slit of the tent's opening. She's going to be late for school again. 
The cooling unit must be broken because they've retracted the roof in the warehouse where the teachers hold their classes. If he sneaks through the back but sees that there's only a free seat, of course, is in the front row. The, th the thought runs through her and turn in her head back into the skip just for the day. But Enyamaka is blocking her path through the side entrance and she has no choice but to duck her head and hurry to her seat. Everyone has their tablets out in front of them with halos displayed, with holos displayed. But if you can't tell what page the down of the downloaded lesson they're on, so she has to stumble through image after image and after image of nonsense until her hologram matches the others. Sometimes the girls said so girls around her snicker, which makes Iffy duck her head even more. She's tempted to run to onto her accent and have the secrets of each of these girls revealed to her. The augmented ones with their stored stored search history is not yet deleted, showing the sites that they use to look at barely dressed men and boys. If Iffy can see all of that and expose them with just a turn of her jaw, but Enyamaka is still in the door. So there's no doubt that Onya would find out. And it's not even beat, not even the beating that Iffy fears so much that she would look at disappointment in her big sister's eyes. So Iffy focuses on the hollow, which is a 3D projection of, projection of a parabolic curve on a graph. The teacher is explaining basic algebra, not even anything useful, not like orbital physics or the ancient textbooks archived sites that Iffy studies on her own. She grit, grits her teeth, and suddenly the world explodes with blue. For a panicked moment, if he sees the gears and wires on, inside her teacher, that she can feel information from other people's tablets run through her head. She senses Enyamaka's distress, and far into the distance, on the periphery of her vision, a familiar sing signal. Onye. She, so fast, she hurts herself. She clicks her jaw and shuts off her accent. She looks around to see if there's anyone's noticed the shadow signals from her device or the little blip in a moment or two of static in their tablets and their teched up bodies. But no one seems to have noticed. She lets out a sigh and listens to the teacher drone on about how algebra originated in Biafra and among the Igbo peoples. How knowledge was stolen by the Fulani tribe when they invaded the North centuries ago. If he wonders what it might have been like to live in a time when Nigeria was newly independent and no longer a British colony, when the Igbo lived alongside the Fulani monsters that the teacher is talking about. But before she can follow that thought, everyone's tablets buzz. The lesson's over for the, for the day. The girls stream out, already giggling, some of them playing with their tablets and turning on music boards to play songs that they've made or recorded. If he slips her tablet into her sack and shuffle, shuffle, shuffles toward Enyamaka, she reaches up to scratch the top of her head when something slams her from behind and she topples forward. And Yamaka's gears groan and she moves to try to catch her, but Ify tastes dirt and turns and finds several girls standing over her. <laughs> Says one of the girls with one of the hair braided into two dark pigtails coming down from the side of her head. The ridges of tribal scars that glisten on her skin cheeks glisten. Without her big sister around, she's just a skinny little Inyabo. And the other girls sticker, snicker to the point with uh, Effie's skin, lighter than theirs. So many mosquito bites show up redder, and the, her bruises take longer to fade. She tries to hide her bare arms in her shirt, the skin color of a natural sand. There is the color of a firm ground. She grits her teeth. Turn on your accent, she tells herself. Hack them. Mess up their systems. And she could do it. She could give herself a moment to imagine the girls screeching as their tablets explode in their hands or the tech of their brain cases short circuits, making them go blind. Then she pushes herself up on her feet. Whatever she would do would just get Oni's attention, or worse, her anger. So she lets it go, just like she does every time. So she looks like a jollof of rice gone bad, so another one of the girls sings. And that gets the others going. Maybe it's just because she has no real family and we are supposed to pity her. The girl with the pigtail sucks in her teeth. Some skinny goat on you found in the bush all alone. If his cheeks burn, her tears spring to her eyes. The anger is right there, close enough to touch. She has to fight against it. But if one of them pushes her, if they even touch her, then if he will give herself permission to latch out. But she will tell Onya afterwards she had no choice. She had to defend herself. She wanted to be strong like her. And that's why the girls were squirming on the ground, wondering why they suddenly can't see or hear or walk. But the girls relent. 
Then they turn to go, and one of them picks up a stone and flicks it at Ify's head in their groups as they walk by. And Yamaka stands before Ify, and then before she realizes she's shaking, rooted where she stands, hands balled into fists, brown it into a frown, and a soft growl growing in, growling in her throat. But the shadow of Enyamaka casts over her and brings her back to herself. And she takes in a ragged breath. The android kneels down and raises a hand to Ify's face. The palm opens up and sprays alcohol on the cuts just above Ify's eye. Ah! Ify slaps Enyamaka's hand away. Get away from me! And that's when the tears come. Suddenly, she's running and doesn't care what direction she's heading to. As long as it's away from school, away from camp, away from Enyamaka always hovering over her, away from the girls who are pointing out how different she is. She stops when the hum of camp activity grows quiet. The small patch of forest she ran into opens out into an outcropping, and below it, a beach. Waves of blue-green water whisper against the shoreline. A few heavy breaths later, if he has calmed down. The noise and the fog in her head dissipate. She sits in the grass, hugging her knees to her chest and stares off into the distance. The mineral, mineral derricks are black silhouettes on the horizon. With her accent on again, the shapes glow bright against the darkened red blood, blood red sky. Even in enemy Nigerian mechs that hover over the derricks shine with pulsing blue light. They, can sw they swim in the sky in the widening oval patterns that leave trails of whatever looks like iffy, like blue stardust in their wake. But iffy knows that it is the pathway that, that's been programmed to them. She can tell in reach out, she can tell the reach of their comms too. She knows that she and the camp are just outside of their grasp, invisible. She fishes out her tablet into, of her sack and programs her accent to pirate uh, enemy connection so that she can access lessons she's been sneaking outside of school. The headline reads, Orbital Physics. And springing out of the text are holograms of parabolic curves and space colonies spinning slowly on their axes. She picks up where they left off. Langra points and spaces between planets and moves where gravity is long both bodies can hold a colony in place. And there are mechs that and the small and the nimble jets that fly through the asteroid belts, dipping and rising and swirling. No matter how hard she zooms in, she can't see the pilots. The resolution gets too bad. She knows they're there. She knows that there are people in those cockpits, maybe women like the type she'll grow up to be. And her heart thrills at the idea. Enyamaka appears at her side and stiffly sits down next to Ify. Ify waits to, for Enyamaka to chastise her for hopping onto an enemy connection for going behind Anya's back and using her accent. But Enyamaka peeks over to examine the holograms that emerge from the tablet. If he holds it out for Enyamaka to get a better look and smiles at the android. You already have a very deep understanding of orbital physics, Enyamaka says in her double voice. And yet, you do poorly in your mathematics class. If he snatches back the tablet. That's because the algebra we do in class is boring. It's so basic. And we keep wanting to show, they keep wanting me to show my work, so I get low marks. But in America, they reward you for just getting the right answers. And that's how you become a pilot. And Yamaka can't smile, if he knows this. There's no real face on her head or lips, or her eyes don't light up to show happiness, but to signal that she's been powered on and her battery life is full. But when if he looks at, at Inyamaka, it feels like Inyamaka is smiling at her. Is that what you want? To become a pilot? More than anything, if he breathes. She's never said it out loud before, and it feels dangerous. It feels like a commitment. She has to do she has to do it now that she has said it, and she'll find a way. Maybe when the wars end and there's a free Biafra, maybe they'll get a launch station built. Maybe somewhere in Yangu or right here where the camp is, and the station will fire shuttles into deep space and they'll join the rest of the world. Another superpower, like America, among the space colonies. And Yamaka chirrups. The bell rings inside of her. If you show shoulders sink, meal time. But realizing how hungry she is, she doesn't remember having eaten anything all day. There must be he we must head back to avoid the end of the line, and Yamaka says. As they head back to the forest, and Yamaka, silent and stoic, if he looks up at the android. When Onya goes through your logs at the end of the day to see what I've been doing and where I went, can you erase the part where I went to the beach? Uh, she finds out I skipped afternoon classes. I I don't want to make her angry. 
I don't want her to find out about my accent. Can you please? For a long time, Enyamaka is silent and like she's sad almost. She speaks to Ify silently through her accent. You are asking me to erase the things that I have touched and seen and heard, the data I have accumulated and added to my core. Shame rushes through Ify. Her cheeks burn. Inyamaka sounds so much like Oni sometimes that it's easy for Ify to forget that in so many ways. She's just like a child, figuring out how things work, gathering experiences, organizing the world around her, learning. Consider it done, Inyamaka says, then holds Ify's hand. That portion of my logs have been erased. Ify squeezes Inyamaka's mechanized hand and begins brings it to her cheek. The android doesn't miss a step. All right, so this one, I think, let me double check. Yeah, we'll read one more. This is a really good book. If Onya and Chinello had timed their run for earlier, they would have had been able to avoid the mosquitoes. But their skin suits provide at least some level of relief. The, the Greek are counters on their wrists beep, noting radiation levels around them. Still, the vegetation persists. The fat, fat tree leaves, big, almost like they've been mutated. The tall grass that swishes around them, brown and yellow in some places, green in others. Onye wasn't alive when the Inyabo went to war with themselves, and the Big Big went off with the ocean away. And the wind swept through the red clouds over the entire continent. She wasn't alive when the sky began to bleed. She, but she's heard stories. Stories of the time when the domed cities and before people started fleeing to colonies in space. A time before the Anyabo, the whites, the, raced to the stars and built America and Britain and Scandinavia and other places they were able to. On, they were the only ones able to hide from human stupidity and what they had done to the planet. A time before Biafra had declared its independence and the war had started. Now, detritus litters from the forest floor where they walk. Juice, packets, torn clothing, bits of broken tech. Chanel stoops beside a pile of blackened earth, moves some twigs and brushed around her foot, and then spots an ancient, smart, ancient smartphone buried beneath it all. She picks it up with her gloved hand, rifle in the other, and blows away some of the irradiated dust. The dust settles in a cloud before her visor. For a long time, she stares at it and slips it into her pocket and to be added to the string of broken smartphones she wears around her neck. Mist hovers in the air around them. Visibility is low, but Chinello, properly cyberized, can see. The level of moisture in the sky, the dips and grooves in the ground, too tiny for Onye to see, the heat signatures of Agba bears and the mutated Wolfu and with two heads and their ridged backs. Leaves swish to the right. Chinella puts out an arm, stopping Onyi. They crouch, beh hidden behind a bush. The noise is or or organized. The noise is organized. Chinella squints, and Onyi follows her gaze. Slowly, an animal emerges from the fog. Its skin pink and light and grows in soft green in places. Its ribs show, but four of its legs are thick with meat. Fur ripples along its spine. Hooves squish into the mud. A short horn. If they were more than just Oni and Chinello, they might have tried to capture it and bring it back, cleanse the meat, and cook it. But they can't spare the ammo, and the thing is just as likely to kill them as it is to feed them. The beast ambles past them, bending fallen tree trunks, bending beneath its weight, drawing the mosquitoes to it as it's thick with radiation, thick with radiation, thick blood. Oni and Chinello wait until it is completely out of sight, a few minutes more, and continue onward. The small clearing, they find more traces of people, broken comms devices, more torn cloth, ratty sneakers, the mark of people who left in a hurry. Chinello, ever curious, moves to examine the broken and discarded tech, more jewelry to wrap around her neck. Onya hisses at her. They're not here for necklaces. They're here for rations. They continue in silence, pausing briefly as a familiar shriek rips through the air. Mechs streak across the sky. The wind sways in the tree branches overhead. Oni and Chinello don't stop, but crouch even lower as they continue. They never think to leave any pads behind, Chinello sneers. Oni doesn't speak for several seconds and then realizes she can't let it go. Who is they? 
The refugees, of course. Whoever leaves all their trash in the forest like this. She doesn't look on the ground, but she does manage to step over some of the unturned roots of a fallen tree. No, it's just empty Fanta bottles and old mobiles, mobiles and rusted chips. More for your necklace, Oni says, allowing herself a small chuckle. The little ones, even if they find us, we can put them to work at least. Give them new lives, Chanello continues to scan the forest, and her head mo moving left to right, right to left in a steady rhythm. Teach them how to fix things. And the older ones? Janelle shrugs. If they are women, we send them to Enyugu. Maybe Umuraya. Then they find some use in the Republic. Maybe they will make more children. And if they are men, we shoot them. Janelle smirks. They both giggle. It feels good to be go on a run with a friend. Most runs pass in silence. But they're quick, they're quick things. Run out, find supplies, run back. Or, more often, run out, find nothing, run back. But when Oni is out with Tunello, she lets herself move slower. More time that she can spend with her, the better. I would like to see part Port Harcourt one day, Oni says, surprising herself. I hear it's beautiful, and, the right, uh, and it's right on the water, and you can't see any derricks blocking the way, making that awful jaga-jaga noise. A smile crosses Oni's face. And there are proper hospitals and a women's clinic. What would we do in Port Harcourt? Chinello jokes. What is there to build there? Biafra. Oni you knows she sounds dreamy when she says it. And normally, she would be called a stupid to believe something as lofty and invisible as the Republic of Biafra. But when she thinks of Biafra, she thinks of buildings of glass and stone and steel that scrape the sky and pave streets and clean fruit that you can eat straight off the trees. She thinks of a place where there is no rust anywhere that where radiation poisoned air doesn't scrape against your lungs as you breathe in the min in the dream her arm is a proper skin attached to it in the black band she always wears and every time she looks at it she doesn't have to be reminded that it is metal and gears and circuitry and maybe she can convince herself that it's proper flesh and blood and bone in this dream of biafra she's fully human wait chanelo sticks her arm out just in time to stop oni from stepping on a mine Oni can't see the red light bl blinking in the mud, but Chinello probably can. It's not from a green and white. It might be from one of the other rebel groups. Oni curses herself. This is what happens when you lose concentration. Likely a sign that they should head back. Come on, Oni says, turning. There's nothing out here. Not today. But Chinello doesn't move. She crouches until she's nearly sitting on the ground and peers into the distance. Then she points. There. Oni tries to follow her gaze. There! Oni squints. Then she sees a small cloud of mosquitoes. What is it? Oni rifles through her rucksack and pulls out a small mound of clay. An Edo Edo. Whatever it is, it's warm. I'll look. She sits, careful to avoid the mine, and molds white clay into something with arms and legs. Then, with a small pin, she pokes two holes that have become, what have become the Edo Edo's face. She twists the limbs a little bit more and looks a little bit more starfish than human. This'll do. Then she puts a spit of glob. She spits a glob of mu mucus over the eye holes in its face. The nanobots in her mucus burrow into the ecto edo edo skin, like Oni's DNA, biomech colonizing by the day, putting into pieces of Oni into it, animating it so it becomes a thing that she can see through, an extension of herself like a mobile device connected to Oni's new neural network and wi wireless internet. Its arms and legs wiggle, then it squirms in her palm like a little baby, and then it glows blue at its core. She sets it on the ground and then pats it on its backside, and it waddles forward. And what it feels like, what it feels and what it sees and what it hears in the echo in Oni's brain like a whisper, a voice underneath her own. The Edo Edo heads toward the mound and then stops and tilts its head, looking it over. First, it's just leather and torn cloth, but then the Edo Edo sees hair. It runs an arm through it and then a hair curls around its white limb. It scurries around and sees a person, a human, and it's breathing. She's alive, Oni says. Before Chanel can stop her, she ra she's racing up towards the body. She comes to a stop, drops her pack, and finishes out her aluminum pole stretcher. When she's got it 
out of the pack and on her back. She takes the Edo Edo and squeezes it. It makes a soft whirring sound, almost like an exhale, and it powers down. And she snu she stuffs down it in her back into a rucksack. Chanel hesitates, only for a moment before helping to lift the woman. Oni starts, raising her rifle, and peers down the scope in the forest. Something has moved. She sends moments scanning, though we can barely see through a fog. We're safe, Janello says, puts a hand on Oni's shoulder, and Oni relaxes. Help me carry her. Oni shoulders her rifle, and the two of them lift the woman and head back to camp. You are getting soft, you know, in your old age. Oni in front, but she can feel Chanello's smirk at her back. Oh? A year or two ago, you would have left this woman to die. Okay, I should probably stop now, but oh my goodness, already, I'm loving how this world is being built. You can definitely tell how much effort that the author has put into this book. It is amazing how she's just built this world. She's already established a lot of conflict, and we're not even towards the, there's, we're not even anywhere near done with the first part. There's multiple parts to this too. That is amazing. This is a great book and I'm really excited to see how it goes. You can already tell stark character differences between Onyi and Ify. You can see how much they actually do love each other even if there's a lot of tension between that because that's the root of all relationships is tension plus caring. I mean, that's what happens. And this writer has set up a beautiful world, made me think about tech, like how we have a mechanized arm. We also have you spit on something. It has nanobots that you can see right through. I have never thought of that before. And it's probably not that far off in the future. So until then, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to go into fantasy a little bit. We're going to be reading, having a book date with Sorcery of Thorns a possible contender for Bulldogs Read next year. All right, so if you liked what you read, please feel free to continue reading that through the library. Reach out to Miss Bell. She might have a couple copies for you available. And until then, I will see you until I will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Bye.